Coming to you live from downtown Detroit, this is Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep with your host, Joel Conan. This is a volatile puppy here, isn't it? And Dennis Dick. I've been a penny. I will buy the stock for a penny. With everything you need to start your trading day. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this Wednesday edition of Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep. Spencer Israel here with Joel Conan and Dennis Dick. It is Fed Day. Today is the day we're finally going to hear from uh, Jerome Powell, going to get that uh, meeting, uh, that release, and then the press conference at 2 o'clock and 2.30 today. So we're going to uh, – obviously, that's kind of the uh, the overarching theme of the day is Fed, Fed, Fed. But we do have some individual news as well. Uh, Nordstrom's not meant to be taken private. We have news on Celgene. We have news on uh, earnings from FedEx. We want to talk about Twitter. We want to talk about U.S. Steel. We want to talk about Splunk. And Dennis brought up on the pre pre market show something that we haven't talked about in a while. It feels like, but food stocks and man, are they getting the beat? So we'll talk about that as well. And of course, we'll take your questions. If you have questions for us in our chat, premarket.benzinga.com or youtube.com slash Benzinga TV. Our guest today, 835, Jonathan Corpina, Senior Managing Partner at Meridian Equity Partners. Joel, what's doing this morning in the market? Uh, speaking of questions, did you mention what we're, uh, we're doing from 9 to 9.15 today? Oh, I forgot to mention that part. Thank you for reminding me. We are doing uh, going to ex- experiment today. We're going to do a new a new thing uh, from nine to nine fifteen. We're gonna Joel's gonna hang out. Uh, he's he's gonna just kind of hang out in the background. If you have questions, he's gonna stay on uh, with you, and he's gonna have his charts up, and he's gonna just kind of look at stocks as you ask them. If you don't have any, that's cool. He's just gonna kind of hang out there uh, on our stream uh, with his charts up. And uh, if you have questions, great, ask away, and he'll do some technicals. If you don't have questions. That's cool too, but he'll be doing that from nine to nine fifteen today. Uh, so after the show, but anyway, that's that's what's going to happen in an hour from now. What's happening right now? Uh, well, there's one stock on the restricted list that you cannot ask me about. Nope. No, the stock on the restricted list is uh, oh uh, dry ships. Nope. That's not okay. Okay, we'll let Dennis guess when he comes on here. I was uh, guessing dry ships too. <laughs> oh really? Okay. Yeah, well, we made the rule. You can't talk about dry ships on Why? Well, that was Remember? your rule. This is my rule. Uh, as Spooser traded down two and a quarter at twenty one and a quarter, we just had a little blip down uh, just about fifteen minutes ago during the pre pre market show. China talking tariffs, but uh, went to seventeen and a quarter, and we kind of bounced back. Uh, Resistance is well defined. Yesterday's interday high and Globex high, nearly the same. So we'll look at 2729 on the upside. On the downside, 17 and a quarter may hold up. I don't know about that, but 1275 with Tuesday's low. And then Monday's low is way down at 2697.25. So a couple areas to keep an eye on here. Crude, uh, crude's moving up here, folks. Uh, 6422. Up uh, 68 cents on the session. Crude's looking good. I haven't been checking the news on that, but uh, at an important resistance area, the recent high of the moves way up at uh, 66 and change. Let's also take a look at the gold market down uh, 350 uh, or up 350 at 1350 and a half. And silver up four and a half cents at 16.23. And don't look now, but Bitcoin is over $9,000, trading up 7% at 9,142. Dennis, you get one more guess of what stock is on the restricted list. I don't know. I really don't know. This is a tough one, actually. I just All I had was dry ship. Same thing that Spencer had in his head. What stock's on your restricted list? Square. Why? Oh, my bet. I've almost got this one on you. Man, I, I suckered the end of that one. You can't fight the tape. You got to squeeze the contrarian blood out of you, Joel. That's what you got to do because when these things start going, the ball starts rolling, it just keeps going. All these lunch bets I keep winning you is because I'm going with the Momo. That's what it is. I don't. I, I, I have squeezed them to the contrarian blood out with my actual trading, but with my bets, I'm pretty good just because – I go with the Momo. And the bet was made yesterday, wasn't it? Or the day before? Two days when did we ago. make this? Two days. Was it yesterday? Ago. Yep. Yep. Two days. 54.50. Yep. You took 
59.50? You, you took 59.50. I yeah, took, I, yeah, obviously. I took 59.50. You should have you nailed me on that. And then you, you have 49.50. So now I'm only two bucks away I know. from another lunch from you. I should have won a steak dinner on it. Square's going to see this today. I, I think Square could see 59. Double or nothing? Today. Double or nothing on today? No, because it's two bucks away. It's not a good tape right now. The tape is awful. Stock is going up in a terrible tape. I mean, that's just what these stocks, Micron too, had a decent day yesterday. Um, it's the same stocks. These stocks don't go down and they don't go down in a tape where everything else is going down. It's telling you they want to go higher. Square wants to see 60 bucks. Eventually the tide will turn, but it has not turned yet. Uh, and also just, I'm cutting back. Uh, no more lunches. I am just, lunch bats are going to be, we're going to go beers. I got to cut back. <laughs> I'm on a losing streak. And I'm, I'm going to be really drunk after winning all these <laughs> beers from you. All right. Let, let's uh, gonna get me all hung over. I'm not going to be able to trade. All right. Let's uh, let's move on. Should we go right to the food stocks here? Because, boy, you were wound up on these food stocks on the pre pre market show. The, what is food, going on? Well, you know what? And I have some theories. And my first theory is, you know, really what was going on in 2015 when these food stocks all decided there was going to be some M&A and they all started trading with PEs of 28 and 30. That's when I got rid of all of the food stocks out of my portfolio. So full disclosure, I have zero food stocks in my out of my 90 or 100 stocks on my invest portfolio. I don't think I have one food stock. And somebody looked at your portfolio, they'd be like, whoa, why don't you own any food when you own 100 stocks? The multiples were too high. The, the value, the, they, they just didn't have any value anymore. So I sold my last ones there. I had some Tyson chicken, which obviously was one maybe I should have held because it's actually held up better than the others. But um, I've sold most of those back in 2015, 2016 when we had all those ridiculous runs. But now you look at these things, they're starting to become a little bit more attractive. The reason I think, and you know, we're down today on all the food stocks because General Mills is disappointed here. But these things have been getting hit for months. And that's got to be interest rate concerns. I mean, these are, you know, yield plays, they're defensive plays. Market doesn't want to play defense or really, you know, in the last month, maybe a bit more. But when yields are going higher, it's not great for defensive stocks like food stocks. Look at the chart of General Mills coming into this report. $62 at the beginning of the year or $61. It's now 46 bucks after losing three more dollars here this morning. Spencer, give us those GIS numbers. And then we're going to just talk food here for the next five minutes. All right, let me pull them up on my, on my screen. I was busy looking at uh, other food stocks, but okay, GIS did report earnings. So I thought that was what you're going, that's where you're going when you mentioned food stocks this morning. I didn't realize the entire sector was getting hit. But anyway, Q3 adjusted EPS of 79 cents. That beat the estimate by one cent. Sales of 3.9 versus $3.78 billion. So just over the estimates on the Q3 numbers. They are, however, cutting their fiscal year uh, earnings outlook. They cut their EPS. Um, they did see it up three what? to four. What do they see for yeah, EPS? The EPS, uh, it was originally up three to 4% for the year. Now it'll be flat to up 1% for the year. So they cut it. Do you by, have numbers on what they're projecting for actual earnings? Just so we can do a quick multiple? I, I, don't, I don't have actual numbers in front of me. I just have that they trimmed it <laughs> yeah, by, by, by 3% uh, for the fiscal year. And uh, that's what I got. Okay, so GIS is seeing, um, and obviously they also, it's operating profit, which wasn't great there either. Um, it's tough. I mean, it's tough to be a food stock here and you disappoint the street. And even though you're down going into the report, this is just simply not good enough, no matter what tape you're in. You're gonna go down on, the, on, on when you're lowering your guidance and you're lowering your comps guidance. Stock is trading down significantly in the pre-market. This is a big hit for a food stock, 7.5%. These aren't like lower beta. These are stocks that typically, you know, are, don't move around a lot. When you see a 7.5% fall in a food stock, that is a massive hit. So lower beta stock getting murdered on the earnings. Uh, Joel, go out to the technicals here, and then we're going to talk all these other food stocks because they are all ugly. Uh, pre-market low is 46.01. Uh, that's a breakdown uh, that eclipses your August 24th flash crash low of 47.43. Uh, this takes you back to levels that you have not seen since March of 2013. If you were banking on it coming down to 45.51, that was your low in March of 2013. So that's where, if I had a short and if you know it was you know coming in, 
I would take a look at that. There's going to be some kind of rally in this today. Uh, these stocks always do these. Well, lower where? <laughs> That's the question. I take a shot at 45 and a half and maybe, you know, risk a buck to make two bucks or something like that. If I was so, if I was short, I'd have a big old iceberg out there at 45 and a half. That's a five year low. So that that's my level, uh, 4638. You're trading off the low, stop near a whole number, but uh, that's the number I like in, uh, in, uh, th at least General Mills is 4551. I mean, look at these charts of these other food stocks and you look at Kraft Heinz, KHC. Started the year at eighty dollars. It's sixty-two eighty-seven. The pre-market it's lost eighteen dollars. I don't even know. They did have an earnings report in there that disappointed. But man, if you were buying on that earnings dip, this has not been good. It has continued to fall. Eighteen dollars is down. I mean, this is a Warren stock, and this has just been annihilated here. Not only that one, Campbell's Soup. That's annihilated. That's going to challenge maybe the 52-week low here today. It's already trading 42.45. Go to Mondelez, MDL, Zebra. That one's held up a little bit better. It was in play earlier, but if that takes out the 42 support, Katie bar the door. That one could start getting ugly there too. Um, you know, continuing along, there's just a you know a lot of these stocks talk about Hershey's has held up. There was rumors, you know, that they were going to do some acquiring before, but a big number for that, I would just say the double bottom. That sets up not bad too as a short. You can get through that 99.71 low from two days ago there, and maybe you do with the catalyst here of the disappointing GIS earnings. I mean, it's not a direct play. It's not as like a play like Kellogg's, or you know, and Kellogg's obviously is down big here today, which we'll talk about in a second. But there's a setup there from the short side on Hershey's. I kind of like it, and then Kellogg's here. K is ugly, taking out the 66 support, taking out the 65 support. We are trading 64, 27 in the pre-market, losing another two bucks. That is their direct playoff of General Mills, and it is ugly too. So all these food stocks are not looking good here and looking even worse this morning. Now, do you sit back, you know, and you look at these things, and you know how I like to be a contrarian investor? Not a contrarian trader, but a contrarian investor. And I look at all these things, and I've had Kraft Heinz on my radar for a while. At some point in time, these things are going to be nice long-term investments, but I'm not sure we're there yet because they just don't stop going down. So maybe you should sit back and wait until it stops going down before throwing these things in your portfolio. I got a spread for you here to put on. Talk to me. Okay. So I, I think that people are still eating, right? So, I mean, these stocks are not going are they? Yeah, I, I guess. I'm, I mean, everyone <laughs> here at Benzinga looks pretty healthy. So what, <laughs> what, what I think you need to do is you need to short Weight Watchers, okay, after this tremendous run. You it, contrarian, <laughs> you. But, Get that contrarian <laughs> stuff out of here. Weight Watchers is going to be $100 stock probably just okay. because. I'll go, just because. I'll go my house against your house. <laughs> Joel is confident <laughs> in his Weight Watchers short. <laughs> that stock has been unbelievably strong. No, I, no. Don't, I don't know. You know, no. I, 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 I'm, I don't know what to say on WTW. It has been a monster performer. This is not, you know, nothing to do with really Kellogg. So these are, this is a separate animal. This is nothing to do I'm talking with about a animals. spread. I'm talking about buying a basket of food stocks and shorting Weight Watchers. It's a spread. <laughs> Think about Somebody's it. Somebody's got to win, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. If nobody's eating anymore. <laughs> That can't be good for, well, maybe that is good for Weight Watchers. Nobody's, maybe Weight Watchers is the problem, Joel. Everybody's watching their weight. They're eating less and all the food stocks are getting hit because of that. Weight Watchers is the root of the whole problem here. You just figured it all out. Until Weight Watchers starts going down, you can't buy the food stocks. Okay. All right, then let's go long Weight Watchers and short the food stocks. <laughs> That's what the trade has been working. That's probably the good trade, the momentum trade. Stay with the moment. the we'll have to talk to Rob Friesen about this one because I know there's a trade in here somewhere. I just Get uh, the pair trader on here. He'll know there's a trade in here yeah. somewhere. You're right. What about stocks like U.S. Foods and like like stocks, like the companies that, that supply the food to everyone, right? U.S. Foods. Well, let's go check them out. U UN USFD. That right. one's done okay. Yeah, right. UN I mean, General Mills supply supplies of food to everyone too yeah that's true yeah you and foods i suppose it's done well okay so there's some separation going on i mean tyson foods has really held up fairly well too considering the annihilation of the other food stocks tsn has actually held up pretty good although that being said this thing has been hanging here yeah. for 74 dollars been hanging here for a while and you start thinking it starts to hang here too long it's probably going lower 
Uh, Guy Adami said something on CNBC the other day, and I never heard anybody say this before, but, you know, it's a great quote. Um, he was saying with a stock when, and, and he used it on the other end of it, when a stock is hanging out near the highs for too long, that usually just means it's going higher because they never let you sell the high. The market will never let you sell the high that for that long. So when a stock sits up there near the highs for too long, it's probably going higher because the market doesn't give you that many chances to sell the high. I'm going to say the same thing on the low end. You look at this Tyson Foods, and if you want to buy the bottom, the market never gives that many chances to buy the bottom. And here you've been between 73 and 76 forever on TSN. This looks like it's going to break down. Um, so, you know, we, we were going to go into a breakdown segment here, which we can, you know, lead into that now. But this TSN chart, this does not look pretty to me because it's just simply been down here too long. And I'm going with the guy, Dami, on the opposite end of it, just saying that the market <clears throat> doesn't give you a chance to buy the bottom for this long. Uh, yeah, and uh, this is a weekly chart I'm holding up here, folks. So this is a, this has been a weekly support uh, going back to February uh Boom, 7250 has been the bottom of the range. So if it takes that out, that would be the bottom of, you know, a trading range for a little bit over a month here. All right. Are you, uh, are we done with the food sector here? We can. Uh... Yeah, I want to go to a couple of breakdown stocks just because I was just going to lead into that tangent there. So I want to talk about U.S. Steel here, X. And here is another example of a stock that I think is ready to break down. This looks technically the same thing, you know, that it's been down here for four days banging its head against this floor here, which it's trying to put in a 3790. I'm going to say it's been down here for too long now. Um, you kind of, the only problem is, you know, it's kind of been between a 3790 to 40 range. So really, if you're looking at this, you don't really want to, you, you've got to almost give it up to the, the high there from three days ago. So if you short it here, you almost got to give it to the high of 4054. But this looks like if it takes out the low at 3790, that this is going down to 34, 35 bucks. And if you look at the original move, you know, you can just do a little like math there. We went from 47 seven down to 38 on the you know, all the tariffs. It's pulled back. You know, you got the bot guys trying to pick the bottom here, trying to. But if you think another five or six point move down, that would take us in the 33 area. I think X is a short here. Uh, I had full disclosure. I do have a uh, short position in X. Been holding oh, you're it. taking it. You're jumping the gun. No, nice. no. I, I jumped the gun when it took out 43 and a half. I talked about that level for nice. like two Stick weeks. Stick with it, Joel. I think yep. you're going lower. Yeah, I got April's on this. I bought myself some time here. Uh, so we'll keep an eye the actual low. I almost covered it on the close yesterday, uh, but I figured I'd give it one more day. 37.90 has been the low of the move. Uh, buyers stepped up to 38, 30, and 40 over the next session. So, so just call 38 the bogey there in U.S. Steel. And then you had a stock on the upside that you liked. What one was I that? like a couple of breakout stocks here. So you can do some pair trades, which in sectors that are not related here at all. Let's go to Splunk, SPLK. I like this chart. This stock looks itching to go here. Banging its head up against this 110 for three, four days. It was a nice candle there yesterday. I think this breaks out maybe even today. I like the Splunk chart, SPLK. Going with it. Uh, this is uh, another Sean Udall pick uh, going back a while ago. And then um, but Zynga kind of uh, uncovered this thing. There was some potential rumors. This might be like a year and a half ago or so uh, that Amazon was sniffing around. Not, never did come to fruition. But uh, if you were buying on that news, uh, you'd be in at the 60-65 level. Dennis, I'm terrible at trading these kind of kind of moves here. So if you want to give us a setup on it and what you would bonify as a breakout where your stop would be on a day trade, uh, go ahead because I always get these ones wrong. On Splunk? Yeah. Okay, I would stop out and you've got to give yourself some room on this one because it's a little bit of a wild child. But if you were doing a swing trade and you want to set up a two to one risk reward, I'd look at the low from two days ago, which was 104.79. Start trading 104. I don't want any part of it if it starts to make new lows. But I think it's on a breakout here. I think if it can get above the 110, which it looks like it might even do today, um, I think you could see 120. So I set up a two to one risk reward, 104 on the okay. stop out, maybe 120, 122 on the top. So SPLK, like it for a breakout. Okay. That's a nice setup on that. All right. Uh, Angie Baby saying investor day is March 27th. I did not know that. Thank you, Angie Baby. You have six days before investor day for a technical trade on Splunkster. All right, S&Ps are just leaking here a little bit, down four and a quarter, hanging out near the lows of the pre-market session at 17 and a quarter. So uh, we'll see. 
20 minutes uh, into the show here, Dennis, we are going to, we're done with our earning stocks slash new stocks. No, uh, no, we're not. Actually, we got to go over to the FedEx because it was a wild child last night. And you know, you're in a tough tape when you report good results and the stock goes down. Give us a number of Spencer for FedEx FDX. Q3 EPS, $3.72 versus a $3.11 estimate. So blowing it away. Good number, yeah. Sales sixteen point five or sixteen point one five billion dollars. Good number there as well. Uh, the fiscal year EPS guidance coming in way higher than the estimate by almost two dollars. Uh, Blowing it away. Thirteen. What's the guidance? Yeah, thirteen sixty one was the estimate uh, for the uh, fiscal year EPS. Fifteen dollars to fifteen dollars and forty cents is what they actually said it, it, it'll be. So oh, they blew that away. Uh, and yeah, still it doesn't matter. They blow it all away. This, you cannot get a better quarter, really, in my opinion, in this FedEx. They will find, the media will find a reason today. They will find a reason to say, oh, no, but this happened, because they want a fundamental reason. They want it. They don't want, you know, that this is just the, the bad tape to report the market. They don't want to hear that. They want to hear that there's something fundamental that the market has analyzed to knock it down. I will tell you that is wrong and just it, it's nothing to do with fundamentals here. It's called reporting in a bad tape. They've been hitting everything hard that's been reporting. It started with Oracle just two days ago, obviously got annihilated on their report. And then obviously, you know, the Facebook, it continues to get hit on its bad news here. It's the tape has just turned a little bit ugly here. So now you have FedEx, it gets a nice lift. It was up over 10 bucks on this earnings report, rightfully so, because it was trading higher. You know, you'd think from a fundamental basis, that move made a lot of sense. These were really good numbers, but that was a fade. And I had it actually written down to fade the pop, although it was running so hard that I got scared and did not fade the pop because it was just such a good report that I was like, man, this is such a good number. I don't even know if I can fade this. Should have just listened to what I had written down on my paper to sell the FedEx pop because I had it already ahead of the number. I was saying that I think this report's a good number. I think it could pop. And I think I need to sell it short into the pop because it's just a bad tape right now for stocks reporting earnings. Well, I didn't do that because the number was so good, I got scared away. Anyways, it would have worked. It got up to 262. You were taking some heat. It got up to 262.30 last night, then turned around. And there was something, you know, they were going to say, oh, it was tariffs, you know, that the, the CEO came on and was saying that the gains they were going to get from, you know, whatever was going to be offset by the tariffs and whatever, you know, whatever. That's nonsense. The reason it sold off was simply because this is a bad tape to be reporting earnings into. And right now, that's a good tell for you. So if you got stocks reporting, it's tough, at least, you know, until the market turns. But right now, sentiment or towards the market is sell the rip. And that's what they did last night in FDX. Uh, 6230, uh, your pre-market high. Had been trading in a really tight range ahead of the report. Uh, really over the last, uh, let's call it last four sessions, you've been in a, a six-point range. We are trade. let's put your pre-market low here. Your pre-market low, or maybe it was an after-hours low, comes in at 4720. Uh, that coincides with a low that you had on, oh, beautiful, March 15th, 47.22. So that's the level I'm keeping an eye on for support. As far as resistance goes, and this is just based, I got a 15-minute chart here. Uh, you got three highs in the same area here, right at uh, three at 252.50. So there are your ranges, that resistance, that's minor resistance. You take that out. Obviously, have uh, some room on the upside, and we're not that far from the closing price yesterday. That's always a good number to keep an eye on on a you know a day where earnings are out, the big boys making their decisions. Yesterday's close two fifty one point ninety nine. Um, yeah, and FedEx also catching an upgrade. Uh, thanks, Jazz. They are catching an upgrade at Stiefel here this morning. I mean, this is a good number, and you know what do you do now? I'm not coming in here short in the stock here now. Um, even though, you know, and UPS, I like the UPS setup for the short actually better than the FedEx, believe it or not, even though UPS has the dividend and, you know, it's more attractive because I think it's more attractive because it's got the 3.36% yield. Just looking at the charts, FedEx is going to be a wild child. You have to watch FedEx if you're trading UPS, but if FedEx doesn't recover quickly, watch UPS at this double bottom here from the last two days, oh, 107.52 and 107.43. If it could take that out, this could be at 105 here again. So I kind of like UPS set up from the short side too. There's a few shorts out there today, Joel. Dennis, short setups. you are just like the trading. I ain't bearish all of a What's today? happened to me? I'm in a bull. I'm, I'm, I'm starting to get a little bit nervous. <laughs> 
Bro, you're the trading idea machine. I'm going to call you Tim. Uh, we- <laughs> I come out with ideas here today, guys. Give me any ideas. So some guy that always uh, talks to me on Twitter, and he's always like, yelling at me you never give any ideas uh, and you know i don't do it on twitter because simply i'm busy trading during the day i mean it's tough to give you know ideas trading ideas on the fly but you know right now you've got me i'm not trading right now so i'm giving you my trading ideas but somebody always gives me heat and saying you never say anything during the day on twitter well you know what sometimes i'm just too busy to tweet guys so you know that's telling you something when you got these people that tweet all day long, you know, and they're pumping this and saying this and they're tweeting all day long. That's telling me they're not a very active trader. If you've got that much time to sit there and tweet, you know, if you're tweeting 50 times a day, maybe you should focus on your trading more than your tweet. I don't tweet when I'm trading. So that's why you don't see me very active during a lot of market hours and even after hours because I'm busy. But right now you got me. So I'm giving you okay. trading. And, and, and you've got two kids. So give the and guy, I got two give kids the guy too. a break. So I just don't have a lot of time. So I know my Twitter is not very active. I try to tweet once or twice a day. But that's all I got time for. Sorry, guys, on the Twitter. But listen on the radio show. I give you, I give you guys a full hour here. I'm trying here. You're trying. Uh, tons of support here. If this does take out that double bottom at 107 and a half and you catch this thing good, uh, throw that bit out there at 105 and see what happens. You have... Uh, I'd say six, seven lows below 105. Uh, the lowest of those being 103.95. So maybe get it. I mean, if you want to cover a short, you get a short, get a bunch of bids out there. At least the first time, I think you'll get a bounce out of that area. And keeping an eye on 107.50, we'll see if that is it. Is it wide now, Dennis, or uh, is it kind of tight? Is there a 107.50 bid out there for you? I can't. Yeah, no, it's wide. UPS 107.05, so very wide. Okay. And it's probably going to trade down. If FedEx opens down, UPS is probably going to trade down. There is the natural sympathy trade there. But it's not going to trade as much as FedEx. And FedEx is only down 0.6%. So they're still trying to figure out. I mean, if you're analyzing this as, you know, a CFA or a charter holder, or if you're analyzing this, you know, as a fundamental trader, you're looking at this and scratching your head. How the hell is FedEx trading down this report? You got to analyze, you got to put on more than one hat though with trading. I'm going to tell you that that is why I've been consistently profitable in my 18 year trading career because I wear multiple hats. I try to wear the fundies hat, I try to wear the technical hat, but I try to wear the sentiment hat too. Sentiment towards the overall market is just not hot right now. And that's the problem that's holding FedEx down. And like I said, you know, you can talk about anything else. Gonna, you know, really, they were talking about the tariffs there. I, I saw multiple headlines coming out that, you know, during the conference call, the FedEx said something about the tariffs, and that was the reason that we had the fall. I still believe the reason we had the fall was just simply they reported a bad tape. Okay. Any more earnings there, Spencer? Uh, well, we had General Mills and we. What about Winnebago? Uh, all right. WGO. We, we WGO can, we did report Winnebago. this morning. Yeah, we we can do that one. Uh, they they just, like the give the what, Winnebago what, some love. Uh, the, these people drive around in these huge campers and on the road there, te- tearing up the roads. Give them some love. Yeah, wasn't everybody it? yells them all the time because you know you're trying to go fast in the fast lane, and you got some Winnebago there sitting in the fast lane trying to pass a transport truck, and you can't get by them, and everybody's yelling at them. So they need to get some love every once in a while. Let's give them some love on the pre-market prep show. WGO right. earnings. Yeah, sixty-nine cents for sixty-two cents on the EPS. Uh, four hundred sixty-eight point four versus four hundred forty-two point four million dollars on the sales. So B on both. Wasn't this uh, like a year and a half ago? We like stumbled upon the stock and were bewildered because it was up ridiculous amounts in in the in the face of a. Uh, in, in in the face of what you thought because of uh, gas prices, right? Uh, wasn't remember that like a year ago we had that? Yeah. 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 Okay. Anyway. Uh, it's been in a tight range um, as of late here for Winnebago. We have it trading down only 35 cents here. Let's take a look at the pre-market action in Winnebago. Oh, man. That's kind of a wide range on one 15-minute bar. So I will just go to the daily charts and – I keep an eye on this low of 42.55. That's a couple bucks away. I don't know, let it battle. I guess what's the closing price on this? Uh 44 even. So I guess Yeah, we're uh, offered 43.60, way down to 42.20. You can say we are still in the price discovery phase of digesting the Winnebago numbers here. So, that being said, um I, I think you got to wait till the dust settles a little more here. Yeah, yeah, the close the swing around the close there. Uh, a 44 even, and that was right near the low of 43.90. So, if they, they want to rally this thing today after the report, they got to get it off the mat here real soon. If not, uh, 
boy, he had a low 4340. That's uh that's right here. I don't know. This thing looks weak to me. Uh, if it goes in a major rally mode, every time we got over 45 and a quarter, it seems like uh, it, c- it can't hold those gains. So those are some early parameters here in Winnebago. Uh, we do have some imbalances. Just came out at 830. I might as well give them to you. Twitter, 104,000 shirts to buy. Twitter absolutely murdered yesterday. What was the headline yesterday? Refresh my memory. It was something uh, that they're going to get sued by Instagram or something. Knock this down. What was the headline intraday uh, that I broke? I don't know about murder Twitter. I don't know about Instagram. I know that the Israeli what was go- it? the Israeli government had uh, threatened legal action if Twitter didn't uh, remove okay. a bunch of pro-terrorism tweets. So, uh, is that what it was? That's what I saw. You know, okay, so, and you know what, and this is something I've been complaining about for a while is those Bitcoin ads that are on my Twitter feed too. They did talk about those no, over the weekend, yep, Twitter and they're talking those. about removing those. Yep, Twitter so those. thank you, Twitter, for listening to our show because I said that a week ago. Please remove all those Bitcoin ads. And look, they're removing them. <laughs> they do listen to pre-market prep. <laughs> I also, you know, you think the Facebookness, you know, everything that was going on with Facebook and, you know, if it would uh, spill over to, uh, you know, Twitter a little bit. Had a real bad day yesterday, but rebounded. Uh, just keep an eye on the 3240, 3230 level. That seemed to be a little bit of resistance here, at least in the pre market trading. Uh, go to the daily chart, and uh, boy, he came back. One, two, three, four, five, six, what, 10 days of gains in, uh, in only one session. Uh, real key level on the downside, though, is uh, that low that you had from yesterday, 30.61. Uh, that matches your 30.64 low. So there's your, your good support there in a Twitter. Uh, 104,000 to buy. If you want to know why it's trading up, there is a fundamental reason not to do with the company, but mad money on mad money last night jim kramer said he would be buying the hell out of this pullback and as soon as he said that the stock started lifting hard and it was actually lifting before he said that it was up all pre all after hours for like an hour i'm like what's going on with twitter why is it trading up 30 cents and then kramer came on and just bullish as hell in the mad money i wonder you know and this is just speculating conspiracy theory a little bit here but they pre-record mad money they pre-record at like four o'clock and you start seeing twitter get a lift you think there's like some producer buddy that's talking to traders saying, hey, Jim's going to pump Twitter. You think that happens? Dennis, you, you get mad at me when I come up with those. I don't know why. I see it a lot of times where, you know, what's going on? Why is the stock lifting? And then all of a sudden Kramer talks about it or something. I don't think Kramer. Kramer's cool. He's not doing that. He does, would never do that. He knows, you know, legalities. But there's a lot of people who watch that, you know, probably pre-recording. I don't know. It was trading up like 30, 40 cents. And then Kramer pumps the hell out of it. And then it continues going higher. Anyways, I don't know. I'm just speculating that there might be somebody behind the scenes that's tipping off some traders because Twitter was trading way up before Kramer said that. Okay. And then it really, really zoomed. And I was looking for a reason all after hours. Maybe it's just out because it's bouncing a little bit. You know, it got killed. So maybe it's not the best example. But I've seen this happen before. And Kramer is cool. You know Kramer wouldn't do anything like that. I, I swear he would not do that. But I just don't know if there's some little exec producer or something, somebody hiding in the winds saying something uh let's take a look at uh, Phil fa- quickly changes the subject <laughs> <laughs> uh let's take a look at uh yeah those comments are uh, exclusive comments of dennis dig they don't represent <laughs> do they do not re- okay, represent benzinga benzinga's no, pre-market no, show joel alconic spencer israel or brent slava uh <laughs> let's go to uh facebook here uh we're getting a quick question here uh letting the dust uh dust settle here in facebook let's see uh came back yesterday i i was looking up at the daily lows you had that low at 61.95 i was looking for that little little bit lower 61.56 i think i put it in the chat it did quite get there and then it took off uh trading down this morning here 150 point uh, buck 55 at a buck 66 60 i mean i guess you just got to wait you got to wait for this thing to hold this low get a little bit of a consolidation and then maybe get a breakout to the upside i just don't think this is going back to 175 180 real quick because you got a lot of people caught here in the last couple sessions and uh 168.15 168.15 was the close. So I'm sure a lot of people would like to get out at the mark. But uh, you, you know s- why Facebook topped out? 
How come? You know why? Because I got on it? No. You know why? Because when was it? When was it? About three months ago, cover of Barron's. It's, it's now time to buy Facebook. Uh, Stock was like, like, remember that? It was on the cover of Barron's like three or four months ago and said, now is the time to get into Facebook. And we were joking because they said at the bottom, you know, when the stock was $18, that it was going to 15 and you need to sell it. And Barron's came out bullish. I think it was and on the cover. And, and, and chat backed me up here. I think it was on the cover three or four months ago. And the stock was like 182. And I was just joking. I even, we even talked about it on the show. I'm like, this could be the top. The Barron's called the bottom. It is the Barron's top here. Ah, <laughs> uh, let's see. Facebook. Uh... There was a there was a Facebook bullish article. I think it was the cover story out of Barron's about maybe two, three months ago when it was in the 180s. And it did go higher after that. It went up to 195. So, you know, they, they could have made some money on it. But now it's collapsed. Well, you know what they wrote in uh, September of 24, 2012? $15. Yeah. Oh, what a memory. Oh my God. That's what I just said. I just said it on the show. You I don't can't listen believe to you me. remembered that with your, 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 uh, it, it's a big thumbs down. Everybody remembers the thumbs down article. Baron Facebook, you know, no good. Sell it. It's going to $15. That was the bottom. And now it's 180 and now they get bullish. Yeah. So Little. anyways, Barron's does a lot of things, right? They've done Facebook all wrong. All right. Well, it's 836. Some stocks just can't trade. There's it, stocks I can't trade. The stocks parents can't trade. Facebook's one of them. It's 836. We're going to take our, our only break of the day and go grab Jonathan Corpina, Senior Managing Partner at Meridian Equity Partners. We'll be right back in a moment. Welcome back, traders and investors, to Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep, brought to you by Benzinga Pro. I'm your co-host, Joel Alcana, along with Dennis Dick. Spencer Israel working the boards and from the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, we have Jonathan Corpina from Meridian Equity Partners. Jonathan, how are you doing this morning? Good morning. I'm well. How are you? Doing good. So we'll talk about good. Fed and we can talk about the Facebook here in a little bit, but uh Boy, oh boy, we were, we were talked about 15 minutes here for about the food stocks here. Kraft Heinz, I mean, this thing since, uh, I mean, just since the beginning of the year, 80 bucks to 63. Uh, you know, we were talking about possible reasons for it. Uh, obviously, interest rates. I just, uh, are you just not getting any buy orders in these food stocks? What's going on, Jonathan? You know, it, it just seems like that's an area and that's a sector that, uh, that people just are not focusing on at this point, right? I mean, you look at all the headlines that have come out over the past few weeks, and it's been you know mostly tech. There's been some M and A activity. We've been talking about financials and and how that's affected by um, how that sector is affected by rate cuts and the new tax reform. It just seems like um, you know the, the rotation of sector chatter has gone round and round, and and the uh, in that particular area of food stocks, it just seems to be one that's not hot, at, and then people are not looking at. I so you need a like a catalyst. I mean, I know Warren's been in uh, KHC for a while. You know, is it analyst upgrades? Is it nervousness over the Fed? What I mean, when you're looking for turns, because if you're looking for a turn in the chart here, it's pretty ugly. So I mean, you deal with institutional investors. Do they wait for some kind of news and earnings report? Uh, you know, what would signal a turnaround uh, in the food stocks to you? I think there could be there's two possibilities of uh, of what really wakes up that area. One is M and A. Um, you know, when we're talking about some uh, some some big institutions that are out there that are always looking for looking at um, you know either either private equity money placement or um, you know a takeover from one company to another. I think that's something that definitely will 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 spark up that area there. And then earnings. Um, as we look in earnings and as we look in the outlook uh, moving forward in earnings season, that also will bring that back into light. I think that um, 
you know this this new this new economic world we're in with tax reform and um, and repatriation and, and the different aspects of it. I think people are just waiting and they're very hesitant to really um, you know to fully buy into some of these areas that are clearly going to f- get affected by interest rates and tax reform. Uh, JC Dem- Dennis Dick here, and I just got a, another question here, and I'm going to change the sector over to the airlines because they are getting hit hard here this morning. It's something we haven't talked about yet on the show here this morning. LUV coming out with some weak numbers here. It is down 5.5% in the free market. Um, if you look at all the other airlines, they're all down. It's going to be a weak sector here today, Delta. Uh, but, you know, you look at this, you look at the airlines, you have had some tough weather there. They've got to cancel some flights there once again. What are your thoughts here on the airlines? What's the institutional trading saying there? Because, you know, they had a big rally in November and December. They gave a lot of it back in February. They're trying to crawl their way back, but now more bad news for the airlines. Always has been a tough sector. Uh, yes, has rallied um, towards the end of the year. I think that was just, um, that's always Everything seasonally. rallied. <laughs> yeah, I mean, right. And also, you know, if you, if you try to find one area or one reason why that too, that just, you know, seasonal holiday travel, and they know that um, that rates, um, that uh, that passenger rates are going to go up significantly. Um, I think when you look at oil prices and how um, you know the volatility that we've seen there, and yes, we are starting to get into a range there. Um, but the the airline companies, the way that they've uh, hedged their oil prices out multiple years, um, I think is also having a effect on that uh, that individual sector. But that's always been a tough one um, because we've seen a tremendous amount of. Um, uh, mergers, right? And we and, and and you've got you know a couple of the big ones that are out there, and it just seems like they are the ones that are that have circled the market, um, but not really seeing the the real growth in that area. And you know tie that into what we were just talking about before. It just feels like um, when we're talking about hot sectors and and household names and companies that people feel comfortable investing in, airlines just doesn't does not come into play with that. Um, but once again, that's going to be something that uh, I think some of the larger institutional investors are going to look at and going to wait and see um, if there is some sort of bounce there or if there's some sort of reason to, to take some of that money, pull it out of one sector and put it into that one. Uh, let's move on here uh, to Facebook real quick. And uh, I mean, you see a big jump in the volume, right? On the news here. I mean, you tripped like 120 million, 130 million. It traded yesterday, 88 million the day before when it averages, you know, 15 to 20 million. Uh, you know, is that more, you know, is that more institutions, you know, saying, OK, this is like a, a, a major fundamental thing that's going on. And I've been long for six years. I don't want to be in this. Or do you attribute it more, you know, the institutions not you know, not really, you know, trying to sit back and it's just day traders like, Hey, this, I'm trading this today, or, you know, your bots trading it and saying, okay, there's going to be big offers there. I'm just going to offer it down ahead of them. What do you, what do you, what is it? Is it the big boys or is it the retail traders? I think if it was a different stock we were talking about, um, I would have a different answer. Um, if it was a different stock, I would say it would be all the big boys and the institutional traders. But since this is Facebook, um, there's such a large retail flow in this name. I mean, it's a household name. The the spectrum of users that use this um, internationally, the age range of people that use this internationally – they want to be in this stock and they always have been and they've seen this stock run um, significantly over time. I think that when you start to see the headlines that we've seen in Facebook and talking about breaches and regulation and SEC, um, the, the, the first ones to really start hitting the sell button is going to be those retail investors. They've been in for a while. Um, they have believed in the story. They're users. And sometimes these headlines um, aren't so far into them. They, they can relate to these negative headlines and they feel like if they, um, you know, if their information can be breached or if they're being compromised in a certain way, they're going to be the first ones to pull the, uh, to, to pull the trigger on this. Institutions sig- do have significant positions in this company. Um, and I think over time, they definitely have pared back their positions and taken some risk off the table as this stock has continued to move higher and higher. I don't think the, the institutions are the ones that are, that are getting out of this one completely. I think quite the opposite. I think the institutions might look at this as an opportunity that once the dust settles, um, you know, you can buy Facebook twenty dollars cheaper than you could last week. 
Jonathan, I'm going to take you to another sector. We kind of got a theme going here this morning. There's a lot of ugly. Uh, so I'm, I want to ask your overall thoughts on the market here, too, in a minute, because a lot of the stocks we're talking about are not pretty. And I'm going to take you to another not pretty stock is Deutsche Bank. DB is breaking down here once again on heavy volume, 234,000 shares. It's down another 4.5%. Uh, commentary from the company here this morning or from one of the executives at the company. Um, multiple headlines coming out uh, talking about a weaker environment. And the stock is down 70 cents on those comments. Uh, this is serious because if you look at the end of January, Deutsche Bank was looking okay up at 20 bucks. We're now at 14 here again. This has just quietly got annihilated here in the last two months. And now we're talking about going back to, you know, 2016 levels here on DB. Are you concerned that, you know, these European banks aren't looking as pretty as they once were and that could spill over maybe into some other uh, areas? Yeah, you know, like you like you mentioned, uh, you know, where it was trading in January towards the end of the year, um, really had a, a, a pretty good run for this stock and, and a stock that's been beaten down over time. Um, when it got to that 20 level, which was the highest it's seen in, in at least a year, last time it saw it was on was on the way down through it. Um, from there, it just really has pulled back significantly from there. And I think we're going to continue to see that that trend in this. You know, if you look at the chart, the trend has obviously been, um, you know, to the downside and, and lower. And we're, we're almost going to be trading at the low soon. International banks clearly have, um, you know, significant exposure, whether we're talking about regulations, whether we're talking about currency rates. Um, as we continue to talk about different, um, you know, rules and regulations and violations from the past, um, Deutsche Bank has always been one of those names that has uh, has always felt some significant pressure on it um, when these when these headlines have come out. It just seems like this stock here has had trouble over multiple years getting out of its own way from from controversy and negative headlines. So a lot of sectors here under you know in, in tough water here right now. You know even the tax have kind of you know been having a rough Twitter had a rough day off of Facebook here. What's what are your what are your traders saying? Like, what are you guys saying there on the floor when you see in the market? You know, we've had an incredible run for basically seven years. Um, we did make new highs on the queues back in March here, but quickly giving it back here. It's starting to look a little bit tough out there again. Are you worried about some more choppy waters here, or is this uh, buy the dip mentality going to come back in? You know, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that I'm significantly worried. Um, the fact that volatility is back in this market, I think, is good, right? We've had these you know, these one-way markets, um, all of 2017 was pretty much a one-way market. And I think as we got into the beginning of the year and got through um, you know, January and February, the volatility really woke a lot of people up and made them realize that this market isn't going to continue just to go one way and that there are headlines out there and there's, there's definitely um, catalysts that are out there that can move this market. So we're kind of like in between um, – you know, the highs and the, the recent highs and the recent lows right now, we're pretty much right in the middle. Uh -huh. um, uh, you know, markets are relatively flat for the year, but I think you kind of have to take a step back and just look at the fundamentals of everything. Our economy has gotten better. Our uh, economic data has gotten better. It seems like the Fed, uh, you know, is going to make a, a move today and raise interest rates. It's going to be very interesting to see what they talk about as far as what their outlook is and how they're going to spell that out to us. Um, this new world, like we've said, you know, a new tax environment and, and new interest rate environment is somewhat uncharted waters um, from what we've seen recently. So I think people are somewhat hesitant, but the overall um, psyche of our market is that this market will continue to move higher in time. Be patient. The fundamentals support it individual companies are doing well and can support a rally. Okay, still my next question here. I was going to ask you uh, about the Fed, uh, you know, keywords, I guess it's, you know, th you know, three hikes or four hikes this year. Uh, I think the only thing that would really spook the market is that if they, you know, if they throw out the quarters and start talking about a half point raise, I think, and the way some of your uh, food stocks are acting, it seems like the, they're thinking that maybe uh, coming on the horizon as well. And it's funny how you talk about being in the middle uh, you know, we had the all time high basis, the June contract at uh, twenty eight eighty one or excuse me, twenty eight eighty three fifty. We'd made that double bottom at uh, twenty six thirty. You know, this twenty seven hundred, you know, just throw out the high, throw out the low. That has basically been your 50 percent retracement and it's been holding. But uh, I think I think you're right. I think the market's going to consolidate here a little bit and uh, see what the Fed has to say. 
We've been on the line with Jonathan Corpina. He's on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange from Meridian Equity Partners. I don't know why it's been so long since we've had you on, Jonathan. You have <laughs> great input, and uh, you can't you can't do video from the floor, right? We, they won't let you. Can- we can't. Yeah, they've got some pretty tight rules and regulations down here, but uh, I don't mind doing these phone calls. And maybe one day uh, when I'm in your neighborhood, I'll pop in the studio. Oh, that that'd be great. All right, thank you, Jonathan, and I'll talk to you again soon. Have a great day, guys. Should we start having like a floor day, like once a week? We bring in uh, different people from the different floors of the view. They're on the floor or been on the floor. What do you think about that, Dennis? I like it. Okay. Uh, uh, there's no perspective like a floor trader. I mean, they get a different feel. You know, he's talking to so many institutional traders there. That's why I always like to ask, you know, what are, what are the traders or what are the, you know, the, the investors saying out there, the institutional investors? Because he's, you know, working a lot of orders for these guys. And he can get a, you can get a feel for, you know, you know, whether this market's heavy or not just by talking to floor traders and saying, yeah, you know, I'm feeling, you know, obviously can't tie any individual orders. We can give you an overall feel of whether they're selling or buying. Yeah, I mean, so it's it, always nice to talk to the traders. primary reason for that being is, you know, when institutions, uh, I mean, obviously, when there's news on something like Facebook or whatever, you know, if the, I mean, he re, re, uh, attributed to the retail, but these guys work orders, you know, for days, maybe oh, a yeah. month, you know, that's why you get these technical formations. So, you know, if he gets one institution on something, then another institution, you know, picks up on it. And these, you know, these orders take several days to, uh, to come to fruition. Uh, S&Ps are getting off the mat here, Dennis. I think you're going to have a real chop fest here uh, in the 27. Ahead of the 20, Fed. Yeah, ahead of the Fed here. Uh, gold and silver are holding their gains. Uh, looking for some other significant movers. Uh, I guess if I guess you're happy if you own some PRTA this morning. Big time, Spencer. What's the deal here? PRTA. Excuse me. P. I can't talk. PRTA. Yep, they're involved in a deal this morning with Celgene. That deal. Actually, that was from yesterday. Uh, Celgene is. Uh, That's after the close. Yeah. Yes. It was. It was after the close. Uh, Celgene is getting what are what are the terms of this deal? Uh, it's a collaboration. Uh, Prothena is getting a hundred million dollars uh, upfront and a fifty million dollar equity investment by uh, Celgene. It has the potential for license payments, uh, commercial milestones, and a whole bunch of, of other stuff. But uh, Celgene putting some money into uh, Prothena. You had this wall of resistance at 35. It would have been nice to play it through there, but you're not going to get that chance because obviously we're open up in the 40 handle here. So blowing up through the 40s. Um, big news here for PRTA. It's a shrug for a sell gene. Doesn't matter to them. But there's a huge company, but PRTA is huge for them. Uh, you have a pre market high just at $42, 42 even. You've struggled there. You do have a daily level there. And now you actually have a couple highs at uh, 42 even. And uh, no, just one high there. 42 even was your Fev first high. So I imagine if you get back up to that area, uh, be good resistance. You know, if you're using the pre market trading, the longer it takes to take out that 42, I think more of the chance that you have some uh, back and fill, uh, especially the way this daily chart has not been looking too pretty here. In uh, PRTA. So maybe some people will use this opportunity to lighten up. Just one other thing when I, I wanted to mention this when Jonathan was on, but uh, you know, you talked about Deutsche Bank and you know that big news that you got in uh, Barclays. Was it yesterday or was it two days? I think it was two days ago that yeah. someone took a big, big stake in it, right? And uh, it was an upgrade. Was it an upgrade? And, and, but there were two things. Someone took a okay. big, it was Sherborne took a big stake in it, and then it also caught an upgrade. Well, that was just nothing but a selling opportunity here. Yeah. Uh, it's been down the last two days. We'll see if it comes down to fill the gap, but a little little tougher to trade uh, since it's, a, it's an ETF. Or not Sticking ETF. Sticking with the deal theme, we have an actual merger here to announce as well. This was rumored yesterday during the day, and if you look, checked out Mule, M-U-L-E, during the day, it had a huge pop. Reuters broke the story midday. Pricing and official deal came out after the bell. Give us the details. CRM Mule. Yep. Salesforce uh, from Mule for $36 a share in cash plus 0.0711 shares of Salesforce. 
a little bit of stock there too, okay. mostly a cash deal for Mule. Mule trading up a 44.33. CRM, it's a bit of an overpay and they're hitting the stock for this. This has been the theme. We've saw the acquirer getting hit here uh, quite a bit here. They're not caring as much about the synergies as, as much as the overpay. So not surprising here that CRM trading down three and a half bucks on this news. Um, I mean, Mule is, you know, going to trade off the CRM to a certain extent, but only 0 0.07 times the CRM. So it's very small for the risk arbs out there. Thoughts on a CRM breaks down now on the yeah. charts, um, you know, on fundamental news. So, yeah, it's a deal. Maybe it's good for them long term, short term. They are not applauding it, though. No, and uh, you got a pre-market low uh, down at uh, 119.24. But the only thing that, that makes me a little bit, you know, cautious on this one is, you know, if the street really doesn't like a deal, then it could get signaled, right? And look what they, you know, I mean, actually, Signal's starting to show a little bit of support here. But uh, they didn't like that deal. They hit it. They kept on hitting it. Now, it's, you know, you got a, uh, a trio of lows, uh, 164, 165 area. Actual low of the move is 163.02. So, you know, where you're stopping out here with the 165 close. But uh, they didn't like the deal. They stomped on it. So I'd be a little leery because CRM has had a really nice run, too. So there's a lot of room. 120 was an area. 119.66 was a low, but then uh, below that gets a little bit dicey. I'll give you one more daily low. 117.64. You could easily see that uh, March 2nd low in CRM. We have a no deal to announce in Nordstrom as well. JWN, we know that the family founders have been talking with Nordstrom, trying to work out a deal. They put a $50 price target out or price out there, which got rejected. But now they're out. So it sounds like the talks are officially over. So not taking Nordstrom private. Stock is getting hit on that. That being said, it's not going to hit that bad. Last night they hit it down into the 46 handle. That was overdone. And the simple reason is that, you know, something I've said here on the show before is that Nordstrom has already gotten hit. I mean, or, 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 or not, not, not that it's gotten hit, but that other retailers have rallied significantly there. So Nordstrom got the big pop up to this 50 originally when, you know, there was rumors that they were going to get, you know, taken private. And, but since then, a lot of the retailers have come back. So I'd argue that even if none of this stuff ever materialized, Nordstrom might be a $48 stock. So that's why it's not down very much. That being said, it's never good. That the deal's off the table. We saw what happened with Qualcomm and it's continued to leak there when there's no deal. Um, obviously, a lot of people were in this for, you know, the potential of a deal and that is gone now. So a little bit of caution there, but I don't know if they're going to murder this. Uh, we're trading down here a buck and a quarter at 48.10. Uh, level keep an eye on is going to be $49. Uh, you've had uh, four lows in that area. Uh, the low, two-day low at 48.84. So all those buyers here, if they're going to be sellers, they'll be doing it at $49. Uh, let's get your pre-market low in here for you. Uh, your initial spike down on the pre-market low, like it looks like a little excited. They took it to 46.27, uh, but quickly recovered off that. So, uh, let's see, got to get back over 49. I don't think we're going to see that pre-market low today. Quick and balance update. Twitter is now 181,000 to buy. So that buy and balance continues to grow off the Kramer pump. $32.15 now. Twitter getting a nice bump back there. Uh, Square, I'm going to win that bet. I'm telling you, 59 and a half. I don't know if you're going to see it today, but I think I'm winning. 64,000 to buy in Square. That's just a monster stock. Micron had a good day too. It's the same stocks that continue to lead us. Um, and those are your leaders. And I don't see why that changes anytime soon. Uh, Micron got an upgrade today, did they? Our price target change? Some, somebody else come out with a $100 price target? <laughs> no, I think this guy... <laughs> so like every other day, somebody gives yeah, $100 Yeah, price BMO, target. right, BMO Capital. They maintain their rating, market perform. They raise their price target to 63. From 43? Well, what if I sold it at 43? What am I supposed to buy it at 63? Well, this now? is a total chasing know. price call. Yeah. Wah, wah, BMO. Okay. All right. Uh, I like BMO. Dennis, any uh, any final thoughts here? I know you're all excited for the Fed here coming up at uh, at two o'clock. I'm kind of looking for some seesaw choppy action. I mean, there was a point, didn't we have a lot of really significant gains on like the 
like before the Fed number? Wasn't there? I wish I would have found the statistic where the you know a lot of the markets gains at least in 2017 were on the days ahead of the Fed meeting. Uh, not sure that's going to be the case today, but ten point range trading down a buck seventy five. I'm going to go on a limb and I'll make a call here on the Fed decision, and it's all about sentiment. What it feels like because you know no matter what they say, you can read it as oh well this is you know. You know, this is raising interest rates here. You know, what, what the tone is going to be is going to dictate going forward here too. But, you know, a lot of times they say, you know, when, when we were, when they were, when the market was rallying like Carl and they were raising interest rates, people were scratching their heads and then they would just justify it and say, well, the economy's strong. Well, you know, here you can look at it from the opposite perspective. Sentiment in here towards the market is wishy-washy, if not a little bit weaker here right now. I think they're going to find an excuse to sell it off on this number. So no matter what is said, I think we're going to sell off on the number. So that's my call. Unless, you know, they say we're never raising interest rates again. Um, <laughs> I think I think uh, the market might get hit on this number. That's my call. Just an opinion. But I think we could get hit on this. All right. Uh, that's it for the main portion of today's uh, show. We, uh, we're going to say goodbye to Dennis now. And we are going to have Joel take the controls. And what we're going to do for the next 15 minutes is Joel is going to hang out with you. And uh, if you have questions, ask away, premarket.benzinga.com, or you can ask on YouTube as well, youtube.com slash Benzinga TV. Throw a ticker in there. Joel will take a look at the chart and uh, do some technicals in real time. So, Joel, if you want to grab the reins, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Oh, well, I'll, start, I'll start you off. I'll grab one from the chat. Uh, Spencer, we got to – We got uh, no, I do have the reins, though, don't I? No? No, nope. oh, okay. have the reins. What were you going to say? Uh, this one right here, right? Okay. Uh, well, first stock that I want to talk about, um, Spencer made one of the greatest comments in the history of Benzinga yesterday. Oh, thank you. And, uh, he was talking about GE. Okay. And Spencer, you bought it, you added it to your portfolio of a uh, hundred stocks. When did you do that? And what, what was your rationale? I don't really buy stocks. Okay. I, I've got, I'm more of an ETF person. I, I don't like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pro diversification okay. anyway. So, but I bought GE just, you know, on a, on a way more or less with money that I could afford to lose. It was a speculative buy. I just kind of said, Hey, what the hell, you know, it's GE it's a behemoth okay. of American business. Uh, they're at, I, I think my cost basis is, Oh gosh, like 15 something, 1560. I think his, his comment yesterday was, I bought this at imaginary support, right? Oh, that's not what I said. What did you say? I said uh, I was getting frustrated <laughs> at the stock that it just won't stop going down. So I said, hey, look, it's at support right now that I just made up. <laughs> oh, that's right. That's right. I think we all I just made. I just made up support right now, but it's there. I see it. Okay. You, you don't see it? Uh, no, we took it out. I mean, you had. This is a predictable pattern, I think, here for GE, at least, you know, on this way down. It seems like they hit a whole number, like, you know, it hit uh, 15, got a little, or no, this was 16. You got a little bounce to 18, came back down. It took a while, found some support at 14, tested it a couple times, got a little bounce to 15, back down. Now you took out the low of the move here at 14. Yesterday's low, 13.63. It's 1362. It's trading up a nickel here, but man, you know, you think it's just headed for the institutional orders at 13 bucks uh, for right now, 1362. That's been the low of the move 1364 close here. So let me, uh, let me go over to the chat here. Um, Spinner is talking about the gold market and uh, we really haven't, I've given you guys updates um, in the gold market, but uh, real no technical analysis. Um, man, you got a bunch of lows here in the same area. Let's call it 1307. Uh, now that's a 10 buck lift there, but uh, had several lows uh, between 1310 and under getting a lift uh, testing yesterday's high. 13 or two day high at 1960 today's high 1920. So there's, there's a good level for you and gold will move. It will move uh, on the, on the fed number one direction or another. So keep an eye out for those levels. Uh, I want to go to uh spinner here. G S U M. 
Uh, Spencer, can you can you check Pro? Uh, you know when I when I'm doing those to see if there's any news and just hop in if there's any news on it. Um, I could do it too. I, I see you're busy over there. Um, Nine thirteen, we're trading unchanged. Let's go. Can't tell much from this. Uh, let's go to the daily charts. Hmm. Potential double bottom, folks. If you're looking at a swing trade, pair of lows, 880, 882, close 914. So that's good. So there's your stop out point. Also had support uh, at 899 and nine bucks. This was back at the beginning of the year. So long term support level, uh, identical ranges from yesterday. Uh, not exactly identical, but 918 and 926. So it gets above there. Uh, you got a lot of room because your three-day high is up at 9.92. Uh, let's see here. Uh, someone's at AG Penn asking about Disney. And I think uh, I think yesterday, I can't uh, believe my Facebook was talking about, uh, I think it was a lo potential long position here. I think it was like a call spread, maybe 100, 110, something like, or selling a put spread, something like, something bullish, 100 bucks. I mean, you talk about psychological levels. Uh, you had um, a low at uh, uh, 100026, February 9th. It's also a couple other lows just above it. So 100 bucks, uh, that's big support in that. Uh, just keep in mind, you are on a one, two, Two out of three, three out of four, four out of five, five out of six, six out of seven losing days here. So eventually that streak will break. Um, on the upside, you're still a buck away from yesterday's high of 102.15. So that's a, a minor resistance point up to that uh, gets up to 103. But, you know, it's a big stock uh, that moves with the market. So the Fed could... Um, uh, you know, definitely, definitely have an impact on the direction of that issue. Uh, Yuri S., can you guys look at uh, PTI? Pardon the interruption. Uh, this stock is trading up 69 cents after a real bad day yesterday. Uh, PTI uh, did announce uh, this morning the withdrawal of an equity offering due to market conditions. Okay, that's so. bad news here. It probably it got... <laughs> I guess that's good news. Well, it, but depends, it, it depends on the price of the offer. Yeah, well, it <laughs> popped up, I think, maybe when they rumored they were going to do that, that maybe they got some low demand. This stock is really in no man's land. If, in fact, you take out yesterday's low of 498, you got a big old gap to fill down to 430. So, And there's a gap on the upside, too. So let it fill in that area and then uh, go with it. Uh, let's see here. We're getting some new people in the chat. I'm going to go to Ron Bird here and he's asking about C A T M. And, uh, that's a, that's a nice setup there. What is this stock? Cardtronics, uh, major resistance. I mean, it's trying to bust through this area. I mean, once you can get through 2750, uh, you have two, three, four highs in that area. I think you got some room on the upside. The problem is it's a buck away from it and um, it's leaning on a double bottom. So 2638 was the close. You don't want to see this. Uh, oh boy, a lot. Of, this is kind of a tight range thing. Let's call it 2650 to 2750. That's going to be your breakout here, either under 25. But man, if it could get some news and clear 2750, uh, you got this big red bar to uh, get some work back on. And uh, that day's high was 29.48, but still consolidating and uh, trying to break out. Uh, let's go here. I try not to miss anybody. Uh, KMI, Kinder Morgan, oil stocks. So let's see. Mm -hmm. Boy, that's not uh, acting too well with you. Just... Caught an upgrade this morning from Bank of America. Thank you. To buy. Okay, getting that uh, from Benzinga Pro. Uh, we're getting a pop up here in a stock that has been trading in the gutter. Uh, 1595 is your pre market high. I'm kind of surprised this thing. I guess maybe an interest rate uh, worries on this one too. Uh, haven't even taken out yesterday's high yet. Uh, yesterday's high was 1619. So keep an eye on that. Uh, if in fact, uh, you could get through that area. You have one, two, three, four, five, six highs at the 1650 area. So a lot to contend with here uh, on the upgrade. If in fact we go into a fade, 
Uh, yesterday's law or yesterday's close could be some minor support there at 15.61. Uh, looking at, uh, well, let's go to a big stock here for uh, TT Mac in the chat. Walmart. Wal- mm. Is it building a base here? You had that island low at uh, 87.60, only trading at, no, it's lower than that. Uh, island low at 85.90. And then uh, support has moved up here. So institutions have upped their bids. It looks like uh, even they were trying to buy under 87 and a half to three days. We are trading up. I think if you're not, if you're trying to buy it on strength as opposed to weakness, uh, a breakout over 9050, uh, that's a double top. I think you got some room. It's, I think it's going to retrace some of this move. Uh, as long as it doesn't take out that low at 85.90 and trading up 17 cents in the pre-market, your three-day high comes in at 90.09. Uh, Sarepta, let's go that for DC1. Uh, Dennis on the pre-market show, he was he's kicking himself. He had this one under 30 bucks. I can remember that. And uh, you got some news on Sorrento? Down, downgrade this morning uh, to equal weight from Morgan Stanley. Okay. Well, I mean, it based on the price action, I don't know how long they've been bullish it. That's not too bad. Trading at 78.80. Let's go to your 15 minute chart. Buyer at 78 even, and we are 80 cents above that low. So that's uh, that's your pre-market low. We are 80 cents above it. That looks good as long as 78 holes. Maybe shrug off this downgrade. Uh, coming back on the upside in order to fill the gap. Uh, I mean, we didn't even take uh, we didn't even take out yesterday's low yet, did we? Or we're right at yesterday's low. Yesterday's low was 79. So you could easily get a uh, a gap fill in this one. I'm sure a lot of people would like to see the close from yesterday at 80.52. So that's always a significant level to keep an eye on. 88 falls. Look for your two-day low of 77 of 11. 3,211 canceled flights. Spencer, can you give us a weather update? What's this, New York or New Jersey? Where's this bad weather? Yeah, we're getting a nor'easter uh, in uh, Boston, which is great because today is the Benzino uh, Women's Health Forum in Boston. Uh, so yeah, we're getting a bit of a snowstorm. Or oh, I, should, I, I should say they getting are getting a bit of a snowstorm. Where we're fine here in Detroit, but uh, yeah, so it, it's it's never going to stop snowing. It's never going to get warmer. We're, we're stuck in like this perma winter phase. You talk about timing. Oh my gosh. Okay, so let's take a look. Um, A R N A. Uh, I think that stock had some. Good, was it yesterday? Oh, what was the news? Well, it had great news yesterday, right? A R N A. Yeah. Yeah, let me pull that up on my pro. Wasn't that oh arena? That was right yesterday. That was the uh or no, it was that from two days ago? I think it was from two days ago. They they, they had that amazing data. They, okay. they they blew away the 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 primary and the secondary endpoints uh on a trial and uh that yeah. Uh, Spoozer uh, continuing the leak here uh, on the lows of the pre-market session. Uh, this one's interesting. You got a major pop to 50 even. Uh, that was in uh, after hours trading. Uh, had a nice pop during the regular session. Uh, just two things I want to point out on uh, on this one here is that uh, you had a pop in the morning right to 44.44. Uh, that was off the opening. That was very early in the session. And if you lined up your daily levels here, you're keeping an eye on your dailies. You can see this high that you had on f- March 5th was 44.50. So I think it opened, rallied up to that, and then came back down. So once again, your daily levels, uh, you know, giving significance. Today, it's trading up a buck. So yeah, if you want to go with the momentum on this one, but if this thing goes red on the session, the close was 39.75. Uh, the low was 38.96. And then you're just talking about a whole lot of air down to 31.48. So, uh, and I'm sure some people caught on this thing too. Uh, anybody that was buying the momentum yesterday. All right. Uh, one more stock here, and then we will wrap things up for now. LRCX, uh, that stock was on, that's a volatile thing. Uh, made a new all-time high, traded up 282 in the pre-market in a red tape. Do we have an upgrade of that or something or just uh, acting like 
a good stat. Is it up on any volume? LRCX, boom. Huh. No, not really. Uh, let's go to the pre-market chart. And see what we can find here in LRCX. Trading at the highs of the pre-market session, 282, 221.95. That's up 282, 2% um, in a red tape. I'm not, we'll have to take to find some news on that one. Let's go to the daily levels here. Close of 219.13. What can I get? I can't give you anything here, folks, because uh, your three-day high is way up at 225. So if the rally continues, 225 and that all-time high was made a few sessions ago at 227. Another relevant number for you moving forward. Oh, no, we've been to 230 in this thing. 230 is the all-time high. All-time closing high is 228.65. All right, everybody. Uh, all right. Lows at Costco for Jazz, and then we are out of here. Uh, lows, ooh, holding on, 85 bucks. Got to, if you're leading on 85 as your, your low, you got to look out. If it takes out 85, perhaps look at it as a short. And Costco consolidated here. Uh, low of the move, recent moves win 182.81. All right, Spencer, you want to wrap things up? Well, that that was a wrap up Uh, on tomorrow's show. We have Kate Long uh, joining us. She is uh, basically our foremost expert that we know uh, on on muni bonds, uh, works at Puerto Rico Clearinghouse, uh, a great person to talk to just about uh, bonds in general. So we'll have Kate Long on the show tomorrow. Uh, But thanks to all those who stuck around with us thus far or this late. Hope you all have a good rest of your day. And I hope you join us again on Thursday. Have a good one.